Welcome to the second lecture of this series on mass spectrometry analysis. Today we'll discuss how to quantify analytes with mass spectrometry. And specifically we'll discuss how to quantify proteins, but here I have listed analytes because many of the principles that you're going to learn today apply equally to the analysis of other analytes such as metabolites. Uh, in particular, we are going to start by discussing relative quantification of proteins, and then towards the end of this lecture, we'll discuss how to quantify reliably proteins in absolute terms, in terms of number of molecules. As we discussed in the first lecture, there are very many different types of mass spectrometry analysis and different workflows. I will not endeavor to describe all of them, but rather we'll pick representative examples as here illustrated with this figure from a review by John Yates and colleagues in Nature. This is a particular illustration of what is known as bottom-up mass spectrometry analysis uh, of proteins. It is called bottom-up because proteins are digested to peptides and what is being analyzed by mass spectrometry are the peptides rather than the full length proteins. Uh, the peptide mixture is first separated by liquid chromatography. This can be along a single dimension of online liquid chromatography, or it can be done in two dimensions. We can first separate the samples offline into a number of discrete fractions and then each fraction can be analyzed on the online chromatography. The advantage of the 2D uh, chromatography being that the complexity uh, of the analytes injected in the instrument at any one given time is simplified and the instrument is given more time to analyze and quantify uh, the, the peptides in the mixture and as a result these methods the two, that use 2D separation can achieve much deeper coverage of the proteome. Uh, after the separation, the uh, peptides elude gradually uh, from the column and they're being ionized, uh, usually by electro-ion spray, as we discussed uh, in the first lecture. Then, the ions are being analyzed by the mass spec detector. Usually there, are, there is a large number of ions that enter the instrument at any given time. And then all of these ions, or the majority of them, those that are intense enough can be detected and their mass overcharge ratios measured with high accuracy. After which the instrument oftentimes selects only one precursor or a handful of precursors to be further fragmented and analyzed at the MS2 level. Uh, if a single precursor is selected, this is usually call, called data-dependent analysis. If there are multiple precursors selected, it is called data-independent analysis. This is an important distinction uh, in, in these two types of analysis which I will not explain in details in, in this lecture. If it's something of interest, I, I can cover in subsequent lectures uh, or we can discuss further in class. Uh, this is a visualization, a reminder of the first lecture of what the instrument actually sees. The first panel here, panel A, gives you the ion map, which is the a full constellation of ions, very large number of ions that are detected during the survey scans at the MS1 level. And if you blow this up and zoom into a small piece of the ion map, you can see that there are distinct clusters of um, ion peaks that correspond to the isotopic uh, 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 peaks of, of individual peptides then these individual peptides can be isolated, uh, fragmented, and their fragments analyzed uh, by uh, MS2 spectrum. And by the way, tandem mass spectrometry, the, the, the word tandem derives from having 
two MS2 scans one after another, that, that's where the tandem comes. Uh, and then from the MS2 spectrum and the fragments of these peptides, one can identify the peptide sequence if the fragments are sufficient to support confident identification. Sometimes they're not, but oftentimes they, they afford identifying the peptide sequence. Uh, and again, here I remind you that a particular peptide is not going to correspond just to a single ion peak, but to a series of ion peaks that correspond to a different number of isotopes in, uh, in the peptide molecule. And therefore, if we arrange the experiment in such a way that some samples contain heavy, more heavy isotopes, we can offset their peaks in M over Z space enough so that they now appear as distinct cluster of ions. And this principle is widely used to increase multiplicity of, of labeling and analysis as we are going to see in the next slide. Generally speaking, there two levels at which we can quantify analytes in tandem mass spectrometry. We can either anal uh, quantify them based on uh, the MS1 level uh, detected ions, or we can quantify them based on ions detected at the MS2 level. Let's first talk about the MS1 level quantitation. The simplest type of analysis will simply inject, will simply involve uh, injecting your peptide digest without labeling with anything and analyzing it with tandem mass spectrometry. Then each peptide can be quantified with the intensity of its corresponding precursor ion detected in the MS1 survey scans. Then we can inject another sample Again, for the same peptide, we can quantify the abundance of the precursor ion in the second run, and then the two can be compared to give us an estimate for the relative abundance of that peptide between the two samples. And of course, the two samples are going to, uh, to have many, many peptides quantified, not just one, and that can allow for relative comparisons, uh, relative comparison in the abundance of all quantified peptides in both runs. This is simple, but it has a couple of potential weaknesses. One very obvious weakness is that only one sample can be analyzed at a time, which means that the throughput of analysis is slow. And this is important because oftentimes we would like to analyze many samples, mass spec instruments are expensive, and the number of samples that we can analyze per unit time is a substantial metric to, to optimize uh, in, uh, in generating high quality data to address uh, important problems. The other aspect that sometimes can be quite problematic is that this workflow is not necessarily robust. Any disturbance in the peptide separation via chromatography or any difference in the ionization of these peptides or any difference in their digestion might impact the measured intensities and might contribute to observing differences in, in the abundance of the detected peptides that are entirely unrelated to their actual abundance in the, in the proteins of interest, in the samples of interest. Um, and while some laboratories these days uh, would like to, to claim that uh, they can perform this type of label-free analysis with high accuracy. Uh, it is type of analysis that is in principle subject to, uh, uh, to artifacts due to uh, variability in the processes prior to the MS analysis, particularly the protein digestion peptide separation by chromatography, variability in ionization, and, and so on. A great way to reduce all of that variability is to use isotopes to label samples and then mix these labeled samples together with unlabeled ones so that they can be analyzed 
uh, simultaneously. The virtue of being able to analyze them simultaneously is that any disturbance, any variation in protein digestion, in peptide separation, in ionization is going to affect in a similar way both the light and the heavy version of, of a peptide. And when we look at the ratio of their abundances, these nuisances due to the variability in the process of, of analysis are largely going to cancel out. How can you do such a, such a labeling? Uh, one approach with uh, what is known as SILOC, stable isotope labeling with amino acids in cell culture, is simply to grow cells in media containing only heavy labeled amino acids. And then the new proteins that are made in these cells are going to have more heavy isotopes and they're going and their corresponding precursors in MS1 survey scans are going to be offset in M over Z space. They can be seen as distinct and quantified simultaneously. A disadvantage, disadvantages of this method um, uh, include that uh, the, it can multiplex to a relatively small number of samples, usually two or three. There are some reports of much higher multiplexing, but that requires very high resolving power and has not been adopted as, uh, as widely used method uh, by the community. Another uh, potential disadvantage is that this method cannot be applied with clinical samples because it is not convenient to uh, label this uh, metabolically by, by feeding patients with uh, isotopically labeled food or amino acids. Another way to perform uh, quantitation at the MS1 level is to label the peptides with uh, molecules that are going to have different weight, that are coded by isotopes. And one practically convenient implementation is to label them with dimethyl, which binds covalently the peptides. And depending on the number of isotopes present in the dimethyl labels, the, the peptides can, uh, a, particular, a particular peptide labeled with different labels is going to, uh, to show distinct isotopic pattern, again, in, during the MS1 survey scans. And these distinct uh, isotopologs can be quantified uh, this method, dimethyl labeling, is going to benefit from many of the aspects that are robust in SILOC. Uh, certainly, uh, variability in peptide separation and ionization can be controlled, but it cannot control as well for variability in protein digestion because labeling occurs after the uh, proteins have been digested. A conceptually different way of performing quantification is not at the MS1 level, but at the MS2 level, as shown in the right portion of the screen. So in this case, the peptides are labeled with what is known as isobaric fandom mass tags. I'm going to tell you what these are on the next slide. But these are uh, molecules that are isobaric, meaning have the same weight as the name suggests. They covalently label the peptides, usually binding amine groups, and every peptide has an amine group by definition. And because they're isobaric, a particular peptide sequence labeled with those different labels is going to, to have the same MS1 features in the MS1 survey scan. They're going to appear as a single peak. When that peak is isolated and fragmented, the isobaric mass tags break in such a way that they form distinct uh, masses known as reporter ion. And the relative abundance of these distinct reporter ions is going to correspond to the relative abundances of the peptides labeled with these distinct labels. This method uh, benefits from being able to control uh, variability in peptide separation and ionization, but similar to dimethyl labeling, it cannot control variability in protein digestion. Uh, there are 
several different systems for isobaric tandem mass tags, tag labeling. Two relatively, two of the most widely used commercial versions are known as TMT and iTrack. So let me show you what a TMT isobaric mass tag looks like. You can see in panel A, the structure of the molecule. One part uh, is the amine reactive group, which binds with the amine groups of the peptides. It has a mass normalizer, which is a portion of the molecule that contains different number of uh, heavy atoms. And it has the mass reporter or the reporter ion, which again can contain different number of reporter ions. And in panel B, you can see how the distribution of heavy atoms can change uh, across the structure of the molecule depending on the label. So in one case, uh, most of the heavy atoms are in the mass reporter. In the other case, most of the heavy atoms can be in the mass normalizer. And when the molecule is intact, because the total number of heavy atoms is the same, the mass is the same. But when the molecule breaks at the positions indicated in panel A, depending on the fragmentation method, uh, the, uh, the number of heavy atoms being present in the reporter ion is going to be different and therefore these tags become distinguishable by the mass spec instrument, by the mass spec analyzer. And you can see um, a schematic of how that works out uh, at the bottom left with a precursor, uh, precursor ion that contains all of these different labels. When it's isolated and fragmented, it generates a distinct reporter ions as indicated with the colored balls on the top of the detected reporter ions. Everything I told you so far was about the relative quantification, how the relative amount of a peptide changes across uh, different samples, uh, and from that we can infer how the corresponding protein abundance changes. But in th and in some cases, of course, we would like to be able to quantify the protein in absolute term. And here you can see in absolute terms, in number of moles or number of molecules present. And here we can see one attempt of doing such quantification of proteins in budding yeast using not mass spectrometry, but uh, fluorescent proteins, green fluorescent protein that is fused to different open reading frames, to different proteins in yeast expressed and measured by uh, a flow cytometry. And you can see the comparison of two biological replicates that provide estimates for the absolute abundance of, of these different proteins in budding yeast. Looking at this data, you might think that this method is very, very accurate because of the high reproducibility of the biological replicates. But you should think twice about inferring accuracy from biological replicates. Because biological replicates share a number of systematic artifacts that might undermine accuracy without changing the measurement. And that becomes obvious when you compare the same estimates by, of protein abundance by flow cytometry to estimates of the same protein abundances by different methods as shown by this very large um, matrix of scatter plots. So you can see that while this method is highly reproducible when compared to other measurements of protein abundance by flow cytometry or by mass spectrometry or by Western blot, the correlation becomes much lower. It is 0.4 rather than uh, having an R squared of 0.99. And this brings me to a very important point in terms of absolute quantitation. Every time when you do absolute quantitation, you should be concerned about the possible presence of biases in the measurements that are not fully controlled or not fully accounted for. You notice that when I introduced all of the methods for relative quantitation, I specifically discussed 
what are potential pitfalls and what are sources of biases such as variation in the protease that is being used in the protein digestion in peptide separation and and these biases are easier to control in relative quantitation because they can be shared between the things that are quantified rather than in deriving absolute quantitation. So you can certainly find many claims for accurate quantification of proteins by mass spectrometry in absolute terms, just based on the intensity, counting the number of spectra or based on the intensity of the precursor ions but you should remain skeptical about the degree to which these estimates are influenced by various biases. So how can you do better? How can you do absolute quantitation without, the, without being so concerned about potential biases? You can do quantitation relative to a standard with known absolute quantitation. For example, if we compare the relative abundance of a peptide in sample A to the abundance of the same peptide in another sample, sample B, where we know we have exactly 100 molecules of that peptide, we can convert the relative estimate of abundance into an absolute one, as shown in this diagram here to the right, where a peptide quantified, for example, by uh, triple A analysis, there are a number of uh, methods in analytical chemistry that allow absolute quantification of peptides. A peptide that is well quantified can be mixed with the uh, analyzed sample, subjected to the entire pipeline of the analysis, and then the abundances of the peptide standard and the peptide in the sample of interest can be compared and based on that, we can derive absolute quantitation, which is probably as robust and as reliable as current methods can, can afford to, to do. Uh, and of course, instead of mixing a peptide standard, you could have a protein standard. That's even better because that can allow you to control for digestion variability for possible artifacts in digestion. So how can you make a distinguishable protein standard? Easy just encode it with different uh, heavy isotopes being present in the protein, and then the peptides generated upon digestion of that protein will produce distinct ions inside of the mass spec instrument. And this is the type of absolute quantification that they would recommend doing if, um, uh, if you're interested in having the highest reliability that the current technology can afford. There are also interesting ideas where you can use relative quantification of both unique and shared peptides as part of a model to derive accurate estimates of stoichiometries between different proteins, ratios between different pro proteins. And that goes in the direction of using only relative quantitation towards the goal of deriving absolute quantitation without the need of making and using heavy standards. With this, I'm going to conclude the second lecture that focused on quantification by mass spectrometry. And the next time, in the third and final lecture, I'm going to introduce methods that can be used to uh, visualize, analyze, and explore mass spectrometry data.